Okay. Well, we, we have come to the end of our series. Looking at how, in God's surprising plan of redemption, there has always been space for outsiders to come to God. I hope you've all found it as interesting, encouraging, and maybe challenging as I have. Over the past few weeks, we've looked at people like Rahab, the Canaanite, a woman who many could have looked down on, but who showed tremendous faith and bravery to help God's people inherit the land he had promised to them. We revisited the familiar story of Ruth the Moabite, an ordinary woman married into God's people whose love and loyalty led to an important branch in Jesus' family tree. Next was an altogether more unpleasant episode involving Ruth's great-grandson, King David, and the murder of another faithful outsider who had come to God, called Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was a perfect example, really, of everything that God wanted non-Israelites to be. He had chosen to follow God, he was honest, loyal, and true. But sadly, this encounter showed that those on the inside are not always as much of a blessing as God calls us to be. Then a few weeks ago, Katie talked to us about Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, a poor lady in the midst of a famine who had just about given up, but who, despite her dire situation, gave the little she had to God's servant and trusted in God to provide the rest. And then last week, we met Naaman the Syrian, a great and important general in the army who, despite his status, could do nothing to rid himself of leprosy. Naaman was at first a reluctant convert as he was used to the sense of control and prestige that his position afforded him. But when he had humbled himself and made himself vulnerable, he too came to discover that God wanted to draw everyone to him. Now, each of these outsiders coming to God have shown us that God is in the business of inclusion and love. Sometimes it's been in spite of the insiders who are supposed to be making this clear. But even still, we see God bringing the most surprising people to be joined to his family. And today, as we finish our series, we're going to be taking a step further back to look at how God is at work in the bigger picture, as well as in the lives of individuals like these people. And we're going to reflect on this remarkable vision of Isaiah that we've just heard read from chapter 19, which shows us this scope and the scale of God's plan to bring all people into his loving family. Now, I must admit, this part of Isaiah was not a part of the Bible that I'm hugely familiar with. We know that Isaiah lived in Jerusalem during the period before and during the Babylonian exile, and he spoke to the leaders of Jerusalem and Judah on God's behalf. Isaiah brought with him a warning about God's judgment, telling Israel's corrupt leaders that rebellion against the covenant with God would come at a cost. He also said that God would use the great empires of Assyria and later Babylon to judge them if they persisted in idolatry and oppression of the poor. But however dire these these messages seemed, they were always combined with a message of hope as Isaiah believed deeply that God would one day fulfill all his covenant promises. So the first 12 chapters of the book of Isaiah, the bit before where our reading today came from, he focuses on that vision of judgment and hope for Israel. It's a section that contains many more familiar passages, including the promise of a new leader from the line of Jesse, one who would be called Emmanuel, sections that we typically read around Christmas time and are much more familiar with. And then the book ends with the the prediction of the suffering servant, again, a section we're much more familiar with. But it's in the next section from chapters 13 to 27 in the middle, where our reading comes today, that is a part of the Bible that we rarely read or, or have preached about in church, perhaps understandably. Here, Isaiah dedicates a lot of time to describing God's coming judgment on Israel's enemies through a large collection of poems or oracles. It's quite vivid and and violent in places. He works down a list of Israel's neighbors, Babylon in chapter 13, the Philistines in 14, Moab in 15 and 16, Damascus in chapter 17, Cush, today's Ethiopia, in chapter 18, 
Egypt, as we heard read in chapter 19 and 20, and then finishing again with Babylon in chapter 21. Now, each of these poems, in them, Isaiah's warning of God's coming judgment on these people, and he's accusing them of all the same kind of pride and injustice that he had earlier challenged the Israelites about. And ultimately, he's predicting these places ruin. Now, I imagine this section was received much more gratefully by the people of Israel than some of the other more inwardly challenging parts of Isaiah's message. A prophet's challenge is often very unpopular among the people that he's called to minister to. Although, to be fair to Israel, a bad reaction was hardly surprising, given that they were a nation defined by the idea that they had been chosen and set apart by God for something special, and given the fact that they often found themselves a small nation caught between the threat and agenda of much larger empires. I'm sure that the idea of vindication of themselves and judgment of enemies would have been a really attractive prospect. But Isaiah never allows them the opportunity to settle on such a simple and self-righteous position. Firstly, because his writings were so full of challenge and judgment for Israel themselves. But also, because of moments like what we're going to be focusing on today, like this breathtaking vision that we find in chapter 19, a vision of ancient enemies united under a banner of worship to God. So let's remind ourselves what it said. It says this, in that day, there'll be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. So why is this so remarkable? Well, to understand the idea that Egypt, Israel, and Assyria would worship God together, be, you know, to understand why that is astonishing, I think we need to understand the context. So let's start with Egypt. With its majestic pyramids and storied history, it serves as the stage for some of the Bible's most captivating stories. Egypt had been a long time enemy of the people of God. And it symbolizes both the heights of human achievement and the depths of human folly. Throughout scripture, we see the nation of Egypt playing a pivotal role in God's redemptive plans depicted as both an oppressor of God's people and at times a place of refuge and hope. So Egypt first appears as early as Genesis chapter 12 as a destination for Abraham during a time of famine. But his looking to Egypt for deliverance from the famine exposes the frailty of human reliance on worldly powers as Abraham's early trust in God appears to have quickly faded away. As he sought refuge in the land of the pharaohs, his wife Sarah's beauty would catch the eye of the Egyptian ruler and lead to all sorts of trouble that we don't have time to get into this morning. But this early encounter foreshadowed a complex relationship between God's chosen people and the mighty Egyptian empire. Yet God's providence and protection are evident as Abraham emerges from Egypt with increased wealth and favor. Let's fast forward then to the Exodus or to the book of Exodus, and to the riveting saga of Joseph, the dreamer with a coat of many colors. Sorry, it's not in Exodus, it's in Genesis. Um, But yeah, sold into slavery by his brothers, Joseph found himself in the courts of Egypt, rising to power as a trusted advisor to Pharaoh. Through Joseph's wisdom, Egypt became a refuge during a time of famine. And the stage was then set for the unfolding drama of the Exodus. Enter Moses, the reluctant leader summoned by God to liberate the Israelites from the clutches of Egyptian bondage. Through plagues, miracles, and the parting of the Red Sea, God manifests his power over the mightiest empire of the time, setting his people free. Now, Egypt's role in these stories is is both as a backdrop of oppression and as a canvas for God's miraculous displays of power. So, This complex nation of Egypt bears many roles in scripture. 
at times a symbol of bondage, slavery, at others a place of refuge. And yet beyond its historical role as the oppressor, Isaiah 19 unveils this surprising twist. The same nation that held God's people in slavery is now envisaged as trembling before the Lord, transformed and included in the divine narrative of redemption. It's a powerful testament to the boundless mercy of God and his ability to turn the tables on our expectations. So that's Egypt. What about Assyria? The other empire that's mentioned in Isaiah's vision. What's their significance? Well, if Egypt were the ancient enemies of the Israelites, Assyria were their current nemesis and the most impending threat at the time Isaiah was writing. In a strange twist of fates, Israel was now running to Egypt to ask for protection from their enemies in the east, something that Isaiah chastises them for and challenges them to turn to God for their protection. In fact, the Assyrian Empire was constantly expanding and threatened to overrun the entire region. Assyria had emerged as a fearsome force, a relentless juggernaut bent on conquest and domination. Its army swept across the ancient world, leaving destruction and despair in their wake. In many ways, Assyria embodied the stark reality of human depravity and the consequences of forsaking God's law. And one of, I mean, Assyria appear in a number of different stories throughout the Bible, but one of the most significant episodes involving Assyria is their conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel, which is recorded in the books of Kings and Chronicles. The Assyrians, under the rule of King Shalmaneser V, I think I got that right, and later King Sargon II, swept through Israel, again like this unstoppable force, deporting the ten northern tribes and reshaping the political landscape of the region. The book of Nahum provides another look at the empire of Assyria, with its vivid depiction of the fall of Nineveh, foretelling the downfall of the mighty Assyrian empire. And this prophetic book serves as a powerful reminder of the consequences of arrogance and cruelty, emphasizing the biblical theme of divine justice. However, in the grand unfolding of God's plan, even Assyria becomes a recipient of God's grace when the prophet Jonah reluctantly became the messenger to Nineveh. This famous story serves as a reminder of God's call to even the most unlikely nations, and Nineveh's repentance, albeit temporary, offers a glimpse of Assyria's potential for transformation. Now, given the context of these ancient enemies, what Isaiah says in chapter 19 becomes all the more remarkable. Egypt and Assyria, once oppressors and enemies, are enemies no more. United in praise of God, the language, culture, and historical barriers dissolve as a unity transcending human understanding takes root. This vision of them one day being united in worship shows us the depths of God's love and his mercy and his ability to turn the tables on our expectations. It's a powerful vision of God's liberating love reaching out to all people, even those who seem furthest away from him. Isaiah describes that there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria and that the three nations will worship together as God's people. What an incredible image. God's love breaking down barriers between nations that were hostile toward each other. God gathering in people who previously seemed so distant from his promises. Outsiders coming to God. The truth of this passage is that we can never write anyone off as beyond redemption. That even those who seem furthest from God's love can be redeemed by his grace. We shouldn't look at any person or group of people and say they could never come to faith or God would never use them. Because with God, all things are possible. There is no one whose heart is so hardened that the light of Jesus cannot enter in. There's no one so lost that the good shepherd cannot find them and carry them home rejoicing. So what does this mean for us? 
Well, as Christians, we are called to love others with this same wide embrace. Isaiah's prophecy reveals the vast reach of God's redemptive plans. His vision encompasses not just Israel, but all nations and peoples. We shouldn't limit our love and our compassion to only those who are like us or people who we are most comfortable with. If we claim to follow Jesus, then we must love all people as God loves all people. We must open our hearts to those who seem most different, most opposed to our ways. We must be willing to cross divides of race, class, nationality, religion, and politics to carry the good news of God's redemption to all who will receive it. It's not easy though, is it? When we look around at the way the world is currently, the religious, national, cultural conflicts that abound, the divisions, even among self-professed Christians, that run deep, it would be easy to give up hope on certain individuals or groups as being unreachable. People consumed by hatred or violence in our eyes, utterly alienated from faith. It's easy to see them as lost causes. We're often very quick to write each other off because of political, racial, or theological differences. But God's vision is so much higher than ours. And he invites us to expand our vision, to realize that even those quite different from us, even our ideological enemies, are not beyond the transformative power of God's love. Jesus commanded us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. And this teaching goes against many of our human instincts. But we worship a God who reconciles enemies into friends. There is always hope for reconciliation. The cross stands as the ultimate sign of unmerited mercy, where Jesus prayed, forgive them, even as hostile forces crucified him. We too must be willing to forgive and love even those who hurt and oppose us. And with God's help, we can break cycles of hatred and violence, and we can see reconciliation where once there was animosity. The walls of hostility that seem impenetrable today can crumble tomorrow by God's power. And with that prophetic imagination, we're all called to see a day when no one is deemed unworthy of grace when diversity of worship and culture will be united in the kingdom of God. For his redemptive plans exceed even our boldest hopes. So where is God calling you to carry this message of love? Is there someone in your life that you have struggled with, that you have considered unlovable, unredeemable, beyond hope? God is saying to you, don't count anyone out. My love knows no limits. Perhaps there's a group of people or a nation towards whom you feel hostility. God is urging you to replace fear and hatred with empathy and understanding, to be a part of building bridges across divides. If God can transform an enemy nation like Egypt into a people that he then calls my people, or redeem a bloodthirsty empire like Assyria into a people that he then calls my handiwork, then no one lies beyond the reach of his transforming love. Do we believe this? Can we join in Isaiah's visionary hope? Isaiah's vision of reconciliation, it transcends historical narratives and it points towards the ultimate reconciler, the Messiah, Jesus because it's only through his sacrificial death and resurrection that ancient enemies will find unity and God's plan for redemption will be fully realized. It's only through his atoning sacrifice that Jesus reconciles not only Egypt and Assyria, but all nations and people to himself. And as recipients of this unfathomable grace, may we embrace our role as ambassadors of reconciliation 
proclaiming the good news of salvation to the ends of the earth. May we as a community embody this inclusive love, recognizing that in the eyes of our merciful God, we are all his people. So allow your assumptions to be challenged. Expand your imagination for who might be included in God's grace. Awaken your heart to greater faith in the power of God's love to redeem all people, including those who to your eyes seem to be the furthest from him. And may this tapestry of God's redemptive plan continue to unfold in our lives and in the world around us until the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. As we finish, may the words of Isaiah inspire us to reach out to the outsiders in our lives, inviting them to experience this life-changing power of God's love. And may we, like the Egyptians, Assyrians, and Israelites in Isaiah's vision, join together in worship of the one true God who welcomes all into his loving embrace.